Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Clarifying Catholicism. Ordinarily, we explore theological topics, but in this series, we investigate the writings of, in my opinion, the most important little-known philosopher of the 20th century, Javier Zubiri. This is not a theological series at all whatsoever. However, if you want to do good theology, you'll need a good philosophical backbone first. So if you want to check out the rest of the episodes in this series, check the link in the description. Without further ado, on to the show. Before we jump into being, I wanted to mention a brief method by which truth is produced by the intellect. I found this particularly useful, though before you listen to this episode, I strongly recommend reviewing our explanation of truth in the previous two episodes. As a brief refresher, truth is the intellective actualization of reality. This means that while the actualization of reality, which is the formalization of content, involves all the senses, from taste to touch, to temperature, to balance, to direction and towards, truth is strictly concerned with the intellective sense of reality. And remember, intellection, just like all senses, is a physical activity. There are two types of truth. Real truth and dual truth. Real truth is our intellect's actualization of raw stimulation, or primordial apprehension. For example, touching a stove produces hot. It can never err because it simply refers to raw sensations we feel. Dual truth is our intellect's actualization of stimulations that have been produced in reality in reference to each other. For example, after touching the stove, I can say stove causes hotness. The logos, which is an ulterior apprehension, connects separate things in reality. When those connections are strong, the intellect produces truth. Much like when the eyes are strong, they produce sight, or when muscles are strong, they produce sweat. When those connections are weak, the intellect produces error. Okay, there are nine phases of truth. Let's go through them one by one. First, a thing is apprehended as an individual thing in the primordial or simple apprehension. The intellect's actualization to the simple apprehension is real truth. I apprehend beverage. Second, a thing is apprehended among other things. The intellect is no longer concerned with one thing but multiple things. I apprehend thing one, beverage. I place it in the field of reality among other beverages, such as soda, water, wine, and bacon milkshakes. Third, there is an association between multiple things. Something about the beverage causes me to associate with certain beverages more than others. If the beverage is purple, I'll likely place it closer to wine and grape juice than beer or water. Fourth, the connection between things one and two is made. Purple beverage is wine. But because this is just based on a limited amount of apprehensions that require more apprehensions for confirmation, I can only say that the beverage seems like wine. Fifth, the seeming of purple beverage being wine that comes from my intellect produces a demand for evidence that it is indeed wine. Without satisfaction of this demand, there is doubt. There is a lack of truthification and a lack of truth. Sixth, when I taste it, and it tastes like wine, a coincidence between the seeming and real apprehension of the taste of wine produces truth. The purple beverage is indeed wine. Seventh, this coincidence between seeming, which was from the intellect, and reality is re-embedded into my field of apprehensions. The connection between purple beverage and wine is strengthened. Eighth, the resituation or reinforcement of wine into the field caused by the experience of tasting it produces what Zubiri calls truth as conformity between what seems and what really is. When you say something is true, you're really expressing something that conforms to reality. You say this is wine because your tasting of wine satisfies any doubt that the drink could have been anything else. The affirmation of the connection between this and wine is an act of judgment. Ninth, perhaps you didn't get a good enough taste of the beverage and you really need another sip to go through this whole process again. When you take another sip of wine, the truth as conformity grows stronger. And stronger. And even stronger. 
This repetition of the whole process produces adequacy, and the more you experience something and subject it to the process, the more adequate your judgment is. And it doesn't have to be the exact same test you might submit the wine to. You could smell it, you could use tools to measure its alcohol content, you could give it to priests and see if they can successfully consecrate it. Okay, that was our refresher on truth. We've talked a lot about truth and reality, but what about being? So according to classical philosophy, beginning with Parmenides, it was assumed that being is whatever is real and whatever is real is true. We've already explored how what is real cannot be what is true since reality and truth are distinct, the latter being formalized content and the formal being an intellective product. But is being just what is real? What would that mean for being to just be what is real? According to Zubiri, even animals can tell if a thing is real or not, but no ancient philosopher would say that animals can grasp what a thing's being is. Thus being must be something else, something that belongs to human intellection. Being concerns what things are, meaning how they are defined, whereas reality speaks to the formalization of all content, and truth concerns what this process intellectively produces, being is concerned with the definitions that are formed in that intellective process. Being is a thing that is actualized in reality. Recall that when a thing is actualized in reality, it is actualized among many other things, meaning it gets its definition from the surrounding things in reality it is associated with. In short, being is a thing as actualized respective to other things. This is crucial because in classical philosophy, reality, truth, and being aren't accessible via intrinsic physical human functions, rather they belong to the realm of souls. Like this bookshelf is a bookshelf, because its physical occurrence aligns with the spiritual form of bookshelfness. This is commonly referred to as correspondence theory, as the particular instance of seeing bookshelf corresponds to the essence of bookshelf that exists in the realm of spiritual universal beings. Zubiri and modern philosophers take issue with this for a few reasons. First of all, as we've hammered in a few times, it makes no sense to say that reality exists outside the physical world. Reality is all around us, and it is unwise and problematic to assume that it isn't. Second, if a thing's being is whatever our souls told us it is, then all cultures would arrive at a similar definition of things. That isn't necessarily true. One culture's chopsticks are another culture's weapons. Third, if the soul told us what something is, then we would be satisfied with having reached with what it is. But as we've discussed earlier in the series, all knowledge produces more questions. Finally, our definitions of things are dependent upon our knowledge of other things. You don't arrive at an understanding of what bookshelf is by just sitting there and thinking about it. You have to juxtapose it against other things like books, or American flags, or swords that are on it. Plus, we've already demonstrated that a person's environment impacts their intellection, such as a Saharan native considering 120 degrees Fahrenheit as hot, whilst an Alaskan native considering 45 degrees as hot. Simply put, according to Zubiri, a thing's being basically is how it relates to other things that are in the network of reality, and a thing's being is defined by the sense of towards that reality impresses upon the intellect via the thing's interaction with other things. I know this cup's being because I've apprehended the cup interacting with other things, which situates the cup in the network of reality. The cup's place in reality, its relation to other things like liquid and tables, in turn, tell me what it is. Basically, we define things based on how they interact with other things. Being is relational, functional, and depends on things like utility and culture. Thus, according to Zubiri, being, like truth and reality, is dynamic, whereas for classical philosophy, being is static, fixed, rigid, and universal. And for modern philosophy, being is in our mind alone and shapes reality over time. Specifically for Friedrich Hegel, being determines reality, whereas for Zubiri, reality determines being. Next episode, we will get into what reason is. Until then, have a great day. God bless you.